see everyone, finally. Um, hi, uh, my name is Ryan Casey Esqueda. I'm currently a junior in the interior design program. Uh, first and foremost, I wanted to thank you all for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to see everyone old and new, and uh, thank you, Roberto Ventura, for letting me do this introduction. Um, before we start, I want to share with you all a short anecdote about my introduction to Cullen and his practice. Around this time last year, I woke up to a message from Cullen. Last time, or last minute, he needed a model for a collection he was releasing in collaboration with Alma Matter, uh, a brand created by fashion merchandising alumni here at BCU. I was a bit reluctant, of course. Um, we had known each other briefly, and we worked on a project before. Uh, I had my graphics class later that afternoon, um, at the same time with Jeanette, so I was definitely afraid of missing that. Um, and I'm not sure if y'all could notice, but I'm uh, not that tall. But, um, so I had little experience in the field. Regardless, I said yes. Um, and subsequently, I had begun to understand what is practice in a multidisciplinary design world is. It led me to engage with the design world in a way that I hadn't thought were possible in what we traditionally here take part in. Recently, our design program participated in a common project, engaging in traditional model making, collaging, and as well as AI. In our practice, new technologies are being developed seemingly faster than ever before. Kerner is an amazing example of someone who has not only been able to take on the fast-paced nature of our world of design, but innovate and push it to new boundaries. Most importantly, these experiences have taught me that in order to get something we have never had before, we must do things that we have never done. I believe that these, this mantra radiates throughout the practice that we all engage with day to day, studio. And without further ado, this is Colin Kerner of Studio. Hello, hello. Oh, testing. Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate each and every one of you guys. And uh, thank you, Ryan, for that beautiful introduction. And thank you, uh, Rob, for putting all of this together. I'm here today to talk to you guys a little bit about my process and what I've been doing um, really the last decade or so of my life. Um, so I have a few slides to run through, but really the point of this talk is not to talk so much about me and highlight myself and say my name a bunch. It's really to inspire those of you who are either in the school, out, out of the school, later in life, doesn't really matter. Uh, these are sort of fundamentals that I've learned to be universal truths for me, my design practice, uh, which is studio. Um, so without uh, further ado, yeah, let's, let's get into these, uh, these slides. Sorry. So yeah, brief rundown of what I'm going to be going over. Uh, I'm going to be speeding towards the demo and the Q&A because that's what I'm more excited about. Um, but yeah, I just have a, a brief introduction and in talking about my life, what the current process and creation workflow is. I'm um, going to withhold some of the information. Uh, and then what I'm currently doing and what the future holds for studio for myself. So this slide is really important. Uh, it's actually pretty much the only thing I care that you guys take away from the whole talk is these three words, not even necessarily in chronological order, um, but the fact that I, I think about these three things every time I'm designing, and that is intention, execution, documentation. So these are three things that um, they're, they're all within one another as well. So there's, it's almost like they're uh, a fractal inside of each other and they kind of can repeat. So what I mean by that is that every time you have a creative process uh, or if you're thinking about any task throughout your day, it is design. So, and I'll get into that a little bit more in the, in the presentation as well, but everyone is a designer, everyone is creating our day-to-day -day tasks, what we do, what we decide to carry out and thus give back to the world. So that's our, our intention. And so your intention is what basically you intend to do, what you, what you want to do with your life. And, and that's completely and entirely up to you. It's, it's a pretty subjective thing. It's, it's the first thing in this, this trio because uh, although I said they're not necessarily chronological, that is what has to precede the other two, essentially, is you have to have some sort of intention towards what you're creating. And again, this is, you know, these are things that I think about <laughs> on a daily basis. So. 
Execution is less subjective. It's sort of, it's still there for interpretation. You can execute in a number of different ways. Uh, and I brought some objects that, um, that we've executed on over, the, over the, the past couple years, but it doesn't have to look like this. It doesn't have to look like an outfit or a graphic or a uh, anything. Execution is, is half subjective, half you know, whatever you want it to be. Uh, so that's up to you, but it has to happen. It has to, you have to execute in some way or else your intention you know, is, is nowhere to be found. No one's going to understand your intention without some sort of execution based off of that. Uh, and then finally, of course, documentation is the least subjective of the three to me. And so this is something I remind myself all the time because you create and then you must document. Anyone who's in studio already knows this. Anyone who's in interior design or any design practice or a professor, you guys know how important you stress documentation and why I think it's really important putting these three things together. And like I said, the, the daily practice of running through these, these three things in my, in my mind is that if you focus on your intention, your execution, and thus your documentation, you really won't fail in, in what you're trying to do. If your intention is led through all three of those things, uh, all the way to the, the documentation part, you have the opportunity to, to create and, and you, start to, uh, you start to basically create a cycle for yourself that, that can really become muscle memory. And so what I really have convinced myself is that I can't really go wrong with this formula of intention execution, documentation, and taking them as seriously <laughs> or, or not as seriously as you want. And, and that's really the beautiful thing about this is I'm not here to talk about myself really as much as I am to just inspire you guys to um, use formulas and tools that maybe previously you, you hadn't necessarily thought of. So yeah, I'm going to just give a brief in introduction on myself and hopefully move through it uh, somewhat quickly just because, um, yeah, I want to get to the cooler things. Um, so this is me as a child, and I'm probably four or five in this photo, but something that I, th I thought was really important to note is that uh, on a daily basis through my intention is to be pure, and it's to be uh, in tune with things that I feel are good and things that I feel the world needs from a design perspective. So what's really important here is that you're looking at me pre-conditioning and you're looking at me uh, pre-learned culture or learned design workflows pre-anything. Uh, and I'm as, ha as happy as can be. Um, and this is really something that is hard to maintain once you get into the design world, the design industries that all of us are gonna go be in, you know, you're convinced against your inner child, and you're sort of taught and conditioned the way that things are. You're, you're taught that certain processes have to happen, and to make a chair, it has to be made a certain way, or a table, or an ashtray, or a pair of shoes, they're made a certain way. Uh, I mean, at, and at this point, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know how anything was made, and I, with my practice, hope to continue that purity and clarity of just really you know, doing things because I want to, and because I like them, and, and that is good enough. And so I'm here to tell you guys that uh, if someone were to ask you why you liked something as a kid, you'd probably just say, because, because I like it, or because it's cool. You don't necessarily have to have some contrived, learned reason why you like what you like. <clears throat> I did not think critically about design until I got into college. So. Jumping, and you'll see <laughs> with these slides, I'm kind of like jumping whole decades at a time. Um, but just working through my life really quickly is what I wanted to do. Um, I didn't think critically about design until I got to college, meaning I didn't have any training, any class in school that got me excited about it, um, any sort of academic opportunity in or outside of school. Uh, and it's not really something that I thought about, and that's why uh, thinking critically about design is something that I do now, but I'm here to just encourage you that it's not something that you need instilled in you from the beginning. It's not like um, genetic, because um, it's something that you can 
you can, your intention execution documentation like I spoke about, that can happen at any day. That can, you can wake up one day and decide that those three things matter to you and you can start to define those things for yourself. Um, so for me, growing up, yeah, I, I didn't think about design critically and uh, that led me to um, you know, just really exploring different opportunities for being creative, but not necessarily thinking about it super critically. I was sort of just, I, I knew that I liked to create. So this photo was taken, <clears throat> excuse me, this, this photo was taken in 2012 or 2013. It was posted to my Instagram in, in March of 2013. <clears throat> and as you guys know, that's when Instagram was, was pretty young. Uh, I was also pretty young, I was 15 when I took this photo, and I remember taking this photo and thinking like, oh, like I'm a photographer now. And I had just gotten an iPhone. Um, and this was taken on an iPhone 3G, and I'm trying to see how good it looks up on the big screen. It looks, looks pretty good. The message is, is still there, you know, over a decade later of capturing a moment within a frame, and that being design. I designed a moment in time. And so, I remember having this really profound thought at 15, and this tree is actually behind my house, uh, the house that I grew up largely in, in Winchester, Virginia. And um, yeah, I, I, I just remember standing on my back deck and holding up my phone and taking an image, and all of a sudden my life had really, had really changed genuinely in, in this one moment, um, realizing that I could design images, and that I could, being at the right place at the right time with the proper intention I could execute, which is thus leading to a documentation of sorts. So I was basically formulating those three words early on. This image really helped me uh, believe in myself and sort of start to identify myself as a, as a creative. And so I started to fall in love with photography, iPhone photography. And if you guys find me on Instagram, you'll see that uh, I really have an affinity for iPhone photography. Um, education inspiration. So, I'm in high school, taking a lot of pictures with my iPhone, um, you know, getting called artsy and, you know, any <laughs> sort of like, uh, you know, not really being supported. Um, it, was, it was sort of like um, I was taking myself really seriously with my iPhone photography, but, the, you know, people weren't really considering it uh, real photography. So that's, that's sort of what high school was. I didn't really take any art classes or anything. There wasn't that many opportunities for that. but. Um, what I did do was learn about a really important person, which might be obvious at this point. Um, and I'm gonna keep it on this slide for a little while because I want you guys to just look at this person um, and, and kind of look them in the eyes. <clears throat> uh, this is Virgil Abloh, in case you didn't know who it was, but uh, 2013 was the year that I discovered who this person was. And um, I'll never forget my friend <clears throat> who, uh, now as a fashion writer overseas, but he was, he was really into the fashion scene. And I liked to dress well, but I, I never was, I never thought of it as like a, um, I never thought of it in the way that, that Virgil was thinking about it at the time, up until my friend in the hallway of my high school uh, came up to me with his iPhone and was showing me pictures of off-white clothing. Uh, 2013 was the year that Virgil started off-white, um, you know, just, uh, it started off as basically a, an art experiment and then is now an international brand um, even after his passing, uh, which unfortunately happened in November of 2021. Um, but yeah, Virgil, Virgil was um, a pioneer in so many different ways. <clears throat> and uh, he, he's a huge inspiration to me still to this day. And ever since I, I learned about who he was, he really has defined... Um, so many different freedoms that I have within my intention execution documentation that they don't, they don't have to be any specific way. You guys don't have to listen to any single thing that I'm saying. You can go do things exactly how you want. And, and just because you like it, that's, that's what makes it good enough. Um, so yeah, Virgil, Virgil deserves a, a proper shout out in this presentation because he's in large part the reason why uh, I haven't stopped at any certain object and why I feel confident designing 
multiple different things at multiple different scales. It's why I feel confident in designing my own home one day uh, is because, um, yeah, architects can change the world by building buildings is something Virgil once said. And uh, that, that's a really powerful statement because um, that just means that you don't have to really take whatever your culturally given title is too seriously. You don't, you don't have to conform to anything. You just make stuff, just, just make things. And with proper intention execution documentation, it will lead you to a place <laughs> uh, and, and most likely a better place than if you decide not to. I wasn't initially, I wasn't initially accepted into industrial design school. So following Virgil's footsteps uh, somewhat, I, I decided to study civil engineering at the University of South Carolina for the first two years of my undergraduate uh, career. And I thought I would be designing and building bridges. So as an 18 year old, <laughs> naive and, and, and optimistic and, and uh, you know, with an off white, screensaver on my phone, you know, I was thinking that I was going to go design the next bridge that would be in, in America and it would be something wonderful. That's legitimately what, what I thought. I thought I would, I would be a, uh, a bridge designer. Um, and then two years into calculus and physics classes, realized that that's not at all what the plan is. And that's not the plan that anyone has for me in that, in that industry. Um, so what I decided to do was, was transition to a new school. I decided to go to Virginia Tech and industrial design didn't accept external transfers. So what I had to do was apply into the School of Architecture, get accepted and then internally transfer after a whole year of doing first year studio. So I did my first year studio, took it really seriously being two years older than all the other kids in my studio. I was, I was taking it pretty seriously, all to not get accepted after my first year. So I am now three years into school and I have very little to show for it as far as direction. So I felt like I had failed. I felt like I was failing at life. <clears throat> after all of this activation energy and, and getting so excited about transferring and getting in, um, I had a 30 minute meeting with two professors that led to me not getting accepted into my dream program. <clears throat> So what happened after that is really part miracle and part destiny, but I think my first year professor, who was the old chair of the uh, industrial design program, um, heard about the fact that I didn't get into industrial design. Uh, he ends up going to the present chair and saying, uh, you got this one wrong, and this kid uh, deserves to be in, in uh, industrial design, and you guys surely have one more chair for him. And so through the good graces of a professor who saw my potential and uh, through the work that I put in through first year, um, ended up getting into industrial design through a back door. So um, I, I was not traditionally accepted by this market, this, this industry. The, the people ahead of me at the school and the, the, pref the professors you know, had a meeting and I was not good enough. But it took one professor, it took one person to believe in me to, to essentially be the reason why I'm here. I, I don't necessarily know what I would have done uh, having not gotten into industrial design school. Um, but yeah, very shortly after getting into industrial design school, this was our first project. Um, and what you see here is a series of stools that I designed using traditional CAD program. So I'm sitting on my laptop and I'm uh, designing this stool using a mouse and a keyboard and hotkeys and it's, it's very mundane uh, two month process of, of making this stool. Um, and as I got into industrial design my first year, this is, this is uh, 2018 that this happened, the fall of 2018, I, I really felt like I had to uh, prove myself and sort of uh, show the others around me that I, I did indeed belong here in the industrial design program and I should be taken seriously as a designer and you know I, I was just trying to create and my, my intention was to create um, furniture and create basically anything I wanted. Like I, like I mentioned I, I knew about who Virgil was for five years at this point. I'd seen what Off-White had become. At this point he'd already given his lectures at Harvard and RISD and Columbia so I'd already seen those 
and I knew what my path was. I knew that I was just going to have an output with proper intention, and that would lead to good documentation. And I think this photo says a lot because scale really can continue. So this, this stool almost looks like a building in this photo, and, and that's eventually what I want to get to is building buildings. So um, this stool is, is cast in solid aluminum at my home, and I decided not to bring it because it's too heavy. Um, but it was first machined uh, out of plywood, and that's, that's some of the models you see there. Also, the 3D printed models um, were a big part of this because it was really my first interface with 3D printing uh, at a, an impactful level. So up, up until this point, I, I was aware of 3D printing. I, I knew what it was capable of doing. Um, but it was, it was very prototypical, you know, and, and it was very, uh, uh, you would never, you would never like show uh, like a 3D print as a final thing. Like you wouldn't go to pin up and show a 3D print. That's just not really something that, that you would do. It was, it was more a, a model making technique. Um, so the 3D printing here is, was a big moment for me because I was able to imagine things scaling up. Uh, and I was able to quickly um, visualize things that I was, of course, creating in a traditional way, which I always felt was a limiter to my creativity. The fact that I had to sit at a, a desk and use a mouse and, and create things in the same way that I would create a spreadsheet, I'm creating a, a stool. Um, and so this was a, a big project for me because I was, I was getting into the weeds and I was realizing things that worked for me and things that didn't work for me. Resource identification was really important for me at school, and I, it's really important for any of you guys that are still here, and uh, it's really a beautiful thing that you have professors like Rob who are bringing in tools like virtual reality so that you all have access to them. And so for me, resource identification was a huge part of the academic process for me because as I just mentioned, I was using resources that were sort of, um, they were allowed, they were, they were encouraged, they were displayed as the way in which industrial designers design. They learn certain CAD systems, they sketch and they keep their wrist really firm as they're creating straight lines. You know, there's just certain things that designers did that I was told at this point um, that limited resources, so it was, it was about kind of working within the constraints of designers' resources, quote unquote, like what, what, they, what the school and what my professors expected us to use. Um, and so a really important next step for me was using virtual reality. And this is all thanks to uh, my business partner, my best friend, Matt, who's sitting up front here. But uh, we, in uh, late 2018, started using VR um, kind of, I started using it as a, as a graphic practice. So uh, you'll see a, a, a crew neck sweatshirt up here um, with the graphic design in VR. And we've, I've been doing that for, for years at this point, since 2017, 2018. Um, but that was like the initial uh, breaking off point for me. So I, I was using traditional CAD, I was using Photoshop to create graphics and such. But VR really allowed me to realized that I could create graphics and print them uh, and put them on a physical garment. And so that was, that was really impactful for me because I was bringing VR into reality, even though it was just a flat image on a shirt. Uh, it, it was very inspiring for me. So this is the first thing that Matt and I ever 3D printed. And uh, it's, it's sitting up here. You guys are <clears throat> welcome to come check it out after. Um, and yeah, it does, it, it's, a, it's a side table. But what's really important about it is that it was designed and printed in the same day. So we designed this in the morning and it was sitting at my house in the nighttime uh, with my cats you know, jumping around and uh, jumping in, inside and out of it. You can tell a cat would love it just by looking at it. And that wasn't our intention, but. Um, so yeah, this was a very important object because it was also the first um, fully 3D printed VR modeled object at this scale that we had ever seen. And please, there's a Q&A if anyone has a reference on their phone of something that predates this, I would love to know. But this is 2019, 
uh, this is VR to 3D printing at full scale. Um, and this, this gave me the moment of realization that um, the resource identification that I mentioned earlier and, and the tools that you access and that you use as a designer are ultimately what define your output. And so it's not you, it's not your genetics, it's not even your decision to be a designer or not because uh, everyone is a designer. It's not really something that you can debate me on, <laughs> even though I guess you could, but everyone's a designer, and I'll tell you why. Everyone designed their outfit that they're wearing. <clears throat> Whether you looked in a mirror or not, you made visual selection, and you made choices to put on the clothes that you're wearing, and you made choices on the route that you would take to get into this building, to get into your car. You made design choices on what music you would listen to, even the choice not to listen to music in the car on the way over here. That's a design, <clears throat> a design choice. So designing and, and building this side table in the same day <clears throat> really allowed me to think about how everyone is a designer and how I am not limited to whatever preconceived notions I have of myself. So limitations aside, you know, I started to think about everything being design in a, in a more impactful way than I had ever before. Uh, and I, I'll never forget when, when Matt and I were out at the facility printing this table and, and, and we erected it at the end and, and my laptop was sitting on it. I was jumping up and down. I had goosebumps. It was sort of like an uh, epiphany for me because I realized that the, the paradigm had shifted and that the, there's, a new, there's a new realm to be building in and, and there's a new way to think about everyone and that is that everyone is a designer uh, whether they like to think of themselves. Uh, as one or not. So we started going crazy. Uh, we were designing chairs, printing them in the same day. We were, we were making step stools and tables, coffee tables and vases, and um, all the while getting <laughs> heavily discouraged by our professors. So there was very little support uh, and encouragement on using, <clears throat> excuse me, on using this VR. How, VR and 3D printing, how could you combine the two? to make final products. You know, that's, that's what our professors would have asked is, uh, you're not using industry standard materials and processes. So that's what you're doing it can't be industrial design. It's not something that we're gonna support. So Matt and I, uh, together, yeah, we decided to rewrite our senior thesis in, in our whole curriculum and we actually had no professor because, <laughs> uh, because we were going so against the grain uh, that we were actually threatened with failure our senior year. I mean, think about that. The, the stuff that we had made at that point was unlike anything that any designer had ever made that I've seen. Again, like I said, find something that's similar, and I will, I'll shut up. I won't say it at any more presentations, but up to this point, no one was doing what we were doing, yet we were being threatened to fail our senior studio. So that was a really energizing moment for me. And I, I remember the energizing conversations that Matt and I would have driving back to our, uh, our respective apartments after printing something. We, would, we just knew we were onto something. We didn't need reassurance from anyone. And the same thing goes for whatever you guys are deciding to create. If you utilize the finest tools that you have access to, and Rob is a, in, you know, allowing you guys to have access to VR, for free, you don't have to buy your headset. Go to Rob after this conversation and say, where are the headsets? Let me use one, let me, let me check one out. You guys can start creating whatever it is that you want. Uh, and combining VR with 3D printing just blew the doors off of my creative process. And so it, it was very impactful and it, it was what led us to create so many different things despite being told not to, being specifically told not to. So process and creation, yeah. Uh, let's just, let's get into it. Um, so we're, we're jumping through the years. Uh, 2019 is, is the side table. The red chair that I just showed you, also 2019, very early. This is 2020, so the, it might be hard to see, but these are the, this is the second shoe I think I ever designed in my life. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't know if there are any footwear designers out there now, but I now, I design shoes professionally now. That's, that's what my actual job is. And I just started designing them in 2020, just because I had time and I had resources 
and I had an intention. So um, essentially why these are important and why I decided to put them in here is because I've been showing you a lot of furniture <clears throat> and there's a lot more than furniture up here. So what got me to this point was just tools, was literally just using tools that I had access to that hopefully more of you guys are gonna have access to in the coming years, but VR was what allowed me to think, oh, I'm gonna just design a shoe. I'm just gonna do it because I can, and I hadn't sketched a shoe in 3D in my whole life. I loved shoes, I loved buying shoes, I loved you know, uh, keeping up to date with, with the newest trends in footwear ever since I was in middle school. But I had never thought to myself, oh, I'm a footwear designer, or I'm gonna work at Nike one day, or I'm gonna um, you know, design shoes for Keen one day. I, I never really thought about that, and then one day I just decided to execute in some way because I had an intention. And then this render is just obviously documentation of the process. So really what sent me on my trajectory to becoming a footwear designer now, aside from running studio, is this render right here and is this pair of shoes that I posted to Instagram. Uh, they went, you know, for me at the time, semi-viral. Uh, I got more likes than followers, let's just say that. And um, yeah, a, a little company at the time called Zellerfeld reached out to me. Um, put, write this down in your notes if you're taking any Zellerfeld with a Z. They are a footwear manufacturer based in Germany and they've been 3D printing shoes since like 2018 or 2019. Um, really sort of under the radar. But Cornelia Schmidt, who's the founder of Zellerfeld, um, he's the other full name that I'll use. <laughs> but he reached out to me after I posted these, and he said, bro, we've, we've got to design some shoes together, and you've got to bring them to my platform. Um, so long story short, I have a shoe that I'll show in a little bit. Uh-oh. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. Anyway, Zellerfeld, Cornelia Schmidt, he DMs me. He sees these shoes, and now I have a shoe coming out on his platform, which is a global release. So I have my own shoe coming out that's going to be fully 3D printed, custom fit to your foot, no factory label, labor, fully recyclable, all of that, off of the back of just me saying, oh, I'm a footwear designer now. In the same way I took the, the little picture on my iPhone that now <laughs> you know, would look like crap on a, on a new iPhone, but I thought in that same moment, oh, I'm a photographer now. And so with that same energy, this shoe brought me so many different possibilities and so many opportunities that we will still see come to fruition. Um, just like some of these physical things up here, um, just off of me saying, I can do it. So it's really, it's about believing in what you can do and also aside, like above and beyond that, it's about tools. And I would have never tried to design a shoe prior to having access to VR. I just, I wasn't doing it. It's not what would have likely happened. But because I started using VR, I decided to design a shoe. The rest is history. I don't do this, just to be clear. I don't create more than I consume, but I say this to myself pretty much every day, multiple times a day, because we consume so much that it's overwhelming to me as someone who wants to be creative how much I'm consuming on a daily basis. And think about how much we consume with these little computers we're running around with, as opposed to someone, you know, let's say even just two decades ago, three decades ago. So that really stands out in my mind, and it, it's something I try to do is this. I try to create more than I consume, and it's like, it's impossible to do, to even think about or to even try doing, because like I said, there's so much to read, there's so much information to, to gather, and that's good. Gathering knowledge is good, and having intention in what you're gathering is good. But ultimately, why everyone's a designer and why so many people don't think that is because they're consuming more than they're creating to a point where they're discouraged away from creating at all because they feel like they're not good enough or they feel like they have some potential that they're not able to reach because everyone else out there is so great and everyone else out there is creating more than me. So this is something that I think about every day and that I take really seriously even though I don't do it. And I'll probably never do it, but it's really more importantly the idea of 
reminding yourself how much we're all consuming on a daily basis. If it's not media, advertisements, social media, um, spending time eating, you know, like consuming in every single way possible. Um, but when are you creating? Are you just creating for school? Are you just creating because someone said, hey, create, or they gave you a prompt? I took that photo on my back porch and I realized that just through this instantaneous means of, of documentation, I was creating, like I said, I was creating in some way. So even if that's taking photos and documenting your process, that word create, I mean, it can mean so many different things, you know? Um, so thinking about it in terms of almost an intangible is a way to kind of keep you on the edge of your seat every day, taking each day seriously, rather than just saying, uh, you know, oh, today's just a consumption day. I'm not gonna create. Well, why? Why would you do that? Try to create in some way and, and maybe stress yourself out a little bit if you went all day consuming and you didn't create. Uh, because if it came down to it, why everyone is a designer and what I sort of, I, I glazed over, but you, you have to design to survive if all of these resources and all of the privilege that we have was, was wiped from our, from, from our access, you would have to design somewhere to live. You'd have to design your strategy for surviving. So creating over consumption is literally survival. So you have to remind yourself, would I survive? You know, do I have the creativity in my, in my brain to, to survive in this culture or in the middle of the woods and anywhere in between? This chair is also up here and it, uh, this is the, the most proud <laughs> I've ever been of creating something. And it was created with, again, uh, my great partner, Matt. And we, we took the process of creating this chair over the course of, it was probably a year and a half or cl close to um, a year and a half. But what's really impactful about this chair is that it, it was combining everything that I had known about design up to that point and also breaking as many rules <clears throat> as we possibly could at the same time. So, you know, this chair, like I said, I'm hopping through time. The shoe, <clears throat> the shoe is uh, 2020. This chair is spring 2021. So we're, we're chronologically moving through time at light speed. <laughs> but this chair is completely designed in virtual reality, meaning we didn't design it in anything but VR. That's all we use to design it. There's no glue or hardware that is used to put all these pieces together so that it can exist as a chair. And, and it's a prototype. So gr mind you, when we start manufacturing these and, and getting them out to the great people of Richmond and beyond, it will most likely be solid wood that we're machining. And, and that's really essentially the only difference. But the 3D printed parts pressure fit together. So the rule we were breaking there was everyone was saying, oh, you know, VR is not precise enough. Uh, VR, you know, 3D printing can't produce something that is, uh, that's product quality. Uh, you know, everyone was still, uh, everyone in our studio, kids weren't using studio like us. You know, we were still kind of the, <clears throat> the outcasts and kind of like these, uh, you know, people knew we were doing cool stuff, but they, they didn't, it wasn't validated. And so, this chair really validated that for us because um, what we're doing, it, it, there's so many heavy-handed concepts built into this one object. So it's obviously inspired by Charles and Ray Eames, the LCW from the 40s originally. <clears throat> and what we wanted to do was basically make a contemporary remix, you know, as if we're design DJs is what we've called ourselves. But we wanted to basically remix the song or remix the track of the LCW into, into contemporary terms. So this, the seed and the backrests are flip, flip milled on a CNC machine in the same way that that stool was the, the negative of that stool so that it could be cast was made in the same way. So applying some, some previous uh, knowledge of that into this new object and also that was kind of like the, a lot of people were CNCing. That wasn't necessarily as discouraged. It was the large format printing that people really were unaware of. Um, and so the frame is really where the magic is in this, 
in this design, and it's the fact that the seat and backrest slot directly into uh, this printed frame, and they could be interchangeable, or uh, you know, they could change colors. You could have different finishes on the top and on the bottom. Um, but the frame itself, interlocking and being structural, really was the groundbreaking part about this object, and the fact that it, it was it was checking so many boxes. Like it was it was really an important object in the in the broader canon of industrial design when you think about tools, resources, and and intention in an object. It, it's it's saying a lot, uh, not only for uh, 2021. But now, three years later, it's still an ultra-contemporary object, and it will be um, in the next five to ten years. It, it will still be uh, considered modern uh, and contemporary as the design gets refined and, like I said, as we improve upon it. Um, super proud of this design. Uh, it's, its current state is a little uh, rough because it's, it gets a lot of use at our house when we have gatherings and stuff like that, um, and it is a prototype. So. What's presently happening um, in, in the practice? What's, what's currently going on? <clears throat> so jump another year, or I guess later that year, um, this, this design here was posted to my Instagram in 2021. Um, and they're sitting up here. I have a couple pairs uh, for you guys to come and see and feel after. Um, but I posted this design to my Instagram in 2021, and it was stolen. Um, and someone sent me someone sent me an image of it um, on a foreign market marketplace, and said, "Hey, this looks like your design. This looks exactly like your design that you just posted." This is two months after I posted on Instagram, so real quick. It, it was stolen and manufactured really, really quickly. Um, and I thought, "Whoa, that's sick. <laughs> that's so cool." Like. They look amazing, firstly, and I just thought I want to get a pair and try them on and see if they're, see if they're actually comfortable. See if it's like if it's not just like a fake image or like a render, you know, uh, like someone did a better render with a real uh, model and everything. Um, so I ordered myself a pair, and they were great. <clears throat> they were awesome. They were like the perfect slide for me. Like they, luckily, the largest size that they were manufacturing fit me, just barely fit me, and I was so happy about that. Uh, and yeah, over time they started to fit me better and I, I was wear testing them. And so I decided, what is more studio than buying back a stolen design and branding it as my own? Because it is my own, it's mine. Wouldn't have existed without you know, me having an intention, execution, and documentation of putting it online. And, and I didn't want to regret that necessarily. So. Uh, instead of just being <clears throat> an angry, you know, a scornful designer, I, I was like, no, I'm going to reclaim this design as my own, and I'm going to uh, pay the factory <laughs> that stole them, and I'm going to brand them as studio and make them my own. So basically, yeah, bought 100 pairs and um, have been selling them through our website, and, and what's really impactful is just that um, you don't even have to make it. Like, you don't even have to make the thing. This is ready-made, you know, as Virgil would say. Like, this is, this is like Duchamp. And I'm, I'm taking a urinal, flipping it upside down, and just r signing my name on it, you know? But the only difference is, is I actually did design them, and they just did a good job of interpreting my design. So. This was a really important moment for the present because even if we're creating you know, completely unique one-of-one -one objects, I wanted to reclaim these and, and brand them all uniquely one-of-one. -one. So that's why you see Studio literally branded like their cattle with a, a brass stamp that I ordered online, designed the Studio stamp and everything, because I wanted them all to have that one-of-one that -one feel, that, that unique feel. And that's really like a, a, a building block of what Studio does now is we don't duplicate anything. So anything you see on this table, excuse me, other than these slides, of course, it's all one of one. Nothing is duplicated. And, and that's really important for me because Studio is a lifestyle. 
it's not a brand. So everything that I'm telling you guys and why I came here today is to not necessarily talk about me and it's why the name of the practice is Studio because it's supposed to be vague. It's supposed to be a vernacular that everyone uses. You know, it's supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to be common knowledge, what, what the general idea of it is. So Studio to me uh, is, is, is the name, the technical name of the design practice, but moreover, it's just a lifestyle of intention, execution, and documentation. And I, I'm gonna keep saying those words uh, as this goes on. Um, so more present stuff. These bags, this bag actually is up here, the one that's on the right. Uh, the one that's on the left was, if anyone knows what Nice Kicks is, uh, the founder of Nice Kicks has that, that bag at his house. Um, and that's Matt Halfhill. He's a, a really amazing businessman and, and footwear enthusiast who started Nice Kicks, I think, in like 2001. Um, but Nice Kicks is worth a look up on Instagram if you haven't heard of him. Um, but yeah, shout out to Matt. And yeah, these bags are really important because uh, they're all sculpted in virtual reality. So it's like, why would I think... I'm a accessories designer now. Oh, because you can, everyone can. You have tools, thanks to Rob, you know, you have VR tools to help you create whatever it is in 3D that you wanna create, and then it's up to you to execute on how you wanna make it, whether it's 3D printing or just using it as a template for, for creating things physically in a different way. Uh, we just chose to 3D print these things out of foam. So different material, but you can come up and feel it after. It's fully 3D printed foam, it's soft, uh, it's, it's flexible, it adheres to your body really well. Um, and so, yeah, this is just studio moving through time and moving through energy of like, what's the limit? Why is there a limit at all? And there isn't because of the tools that we're using. Um, so get into future a little bit hopefully get through these slides in the next five minutes because <clears throat> I want to leave enough time uh, for the demo and the Q&A. These are my Zellerfeld shoes that are going to come out um, in the next uh, month or so, should be the beginning of March, but these are going to be globally released shoes that I mentioned earlier are fully customizable uh, as in terms of fit, so you're, the fit can be ultra specific to your foot through a 3D scan uh, and a globally released shoe which is, you know, a couple years ago, I didn't, I had just started designing shoes. So what's really important is that th the VR and 3D printing have really allowed me to take myself seriously as a designer in so many different industries, and, and you can too. That's basically my point with this whole presentation is it's not about me, it's about the objects and it's about becoming inspired through the fact that there's not really an end, you, there, there's no bookend to what we can create um, and what you can create uh, if, you, if you so choose to create it. So yeah, I'm really excited about these shoes. They're called Studio Runners um, and these were printed at our house. So Zellerfeld didn't send me these, these were just conjured in my brain and on, on a VR headset and then print it at my house. And so the beautiful thing about 3D files and 3D printing, and I'll, I'll get into it really quickly because it's important, is that when you create a, a 3D file, as a lot of you probably know, it doesn't go anywhere unless you delete it or unless it's someone, you know, like corrupts the file or something. So if you keep it safely stored on a hard drive, you have it forever. So what I've actually done in the past is design shoes in VR and then I've sold them as digital files so that collectors at a global level can buy them and print them at home, and people have done that. People have collected a shoe that I've designed, sold online, and then printed them at their house in Thailand. So this is all the way around the world, and someone in Thailand is currently wearing a pair of, not these, but a, a completely different, again, one of one uh, pair of shoes that I designed in VR, and uh, they were 3D printed. So that workflow, is uh, uh, super powerful. So we create our reality, we define our future. Yeah, kind of a corny slide, um, but it's true. And so every single day, like I mentioned, 
you, you design your reality. It's, it's not up to, you're not like this victim of the world. You know, you're, you're not like this, uh, um, you're not just subject to basically consuming or, uh, you know, just being at the, at the helm of something else. You are in control of individually designing your reality and it will then drive the definition of your future. So for me, it's creating objects and creating experiences. Uh, you know, for some people it might be uh, writing um, or, you know, doing any sort of creative output, but create and define are really the two words that matter there. Um, and it, it's just to, it's an, I'm just, I'm trying to inspire you guys to create and, and realize that it's not just arts and crafts. You're, you're defining what the future is for every single person every time you create and to take it seriously it is really important. You know, so it can be whimsical. Your intention can be, oh, I'm just doing a little sketch, like it's nothing serious. But that defines what the future of your process will be and what the future of the world will be. Um, and, and so I think taking that seriously is really important. This is, a, uh, this is one of the final slides, but this is a 3D printed house. Um, don't look too close because it <laughs> looks kind of weird, but this was printed in Midlothian. Uh, so this is a company a couple years ago. This was July of 2021 that I took this photo. Uh, you can see the, the name Alquist 3D at the top, and then Kobod. Kobod is the name of the robot, uh, or the gantry robot style setup that they have. Um, Kobod makes great machines. And then Alquist 3D, eh, they're, they're all right. Um, <laughs> they have some, some weird management, but they were printing this house a couple years ago. And I went and I took some of this photo. The margins are filled in a little bit, but um, this is, this is where the future of studio is heading and this is where the future of VR and 3D printing is going, where there's uh, an interaction with, at, at scale, what you're creating while you're creating it. And you guys will see a little bit more of what I'm talking about with the demo, but there's no limit to the possibilities of 3D printing. So I, I think what's really great to show is you see so many complex organic forms here, you're looking at rectangular prisms here. There's some windows, but, but essentially it's just, it's, it's four walls and a roof. And so if you think about how just scale is the limitation, how exciting is it that we have a future where 3D printed homes could look like that yellow vessel up there. Intention, done on purpose, it's deliberate. It is up to you. Your intention is up to you. If your intention is to just say, F it, I'm not gonna do anything today or this week or for the next five years, that is on you, that's not on anybody else. So the intention is really at the base, it's like it's the, the jumping off point. You have to decide what you wanna be and you have to also just believe that you can do it. Uh, and so intention is, is, is like the seed, intention is the, the starting point. Execution, carrying out of a plan, order, course of action. So again, this can be whatever. This can be any sort of form of execution that you want. For me, it just happened to be 3D printing. But your intention and your execution can be anything in the world. It, just, it matters that it happens, and it matters that you try to use the, the, the most modern tools that you have access to. And so what I'm trying to explain to you guys is that VR and 3D printing, as my execution, redefined my whole life as a designer and brings me to speak in front of you guys and have global products coming out and, and work on a bunch of different things that I'm proud of. Uh, and documentation is, is arguably the most important to me. If, if you guys are really curious, documentation is just, you know, picks or it didn't happen, essentially. You know, it's phone eats first. It's, it's, it's whatever necessarily you want to associate it with, but it is a real pertinent thing in our time because we have such access to documentation, and it's like me taking the photo on my back porch, it can lead to so much. So documenting even things you didn't create or intend or execute on can lead you back to an intention and execution. So that's why I didn't necessarily have them in a circle with like arrows pointing to one another because they're, they're not always cyclical or, or you know, recycled in that same way. Documentation can be the first part of your process. Documentation could be you 
consuming a bunch and then saying, all right, now it's my time to create. So there's no, nothing has to happen before the other. It's really just thinking about all these words and these three words in particular that really help me on a daily basis. So I'm gonna jump into a demo here in VR and show you guys a little bit uh, of the process that I go through to create things. Uh, I have a little room set up and everything. And uh, what's really cool is I'm gonna be able to show you guys the flyer that me and Ryan made for this event and a few other things as well. Um, but yeah, this is a MetaQuest Pro. Rob has some Quest 2s available for people. Um, but yeah, here we are. Can everyone see this? Great. So yeah, let's go over here. This is the flyer for the event. It's all in like monochromatic color right now, but I can reach out and change color of things. Hi, VCU. Here are these words that I was talking about, and they're actually, they're 3D words. So they're entirely 3D. I didn't write these on Procreate or anything. Um, they're fully 3D, and so yeah, I'm, I'm in this environment doing a bunch of different things. I don't know if I just changed that three times, but title card, date, yeah, so VR is really powerful because before I'm, I'm sitting at a desk with a little mouse here and a, and a monitor and I'm limited to this space here, my keyboard. But in VR, I can look at things from all perspectives at one time. So if I want to design a bag on this person, I just start designing a bag. You know, that's all I'm going to be doing is, is maybe drawing some lines, getting my rough idea of where I want the bag to be. If I want to design some shoes, I'm going to start designing shoes. Not like this, but... <laughs> you guys can see that if, if I want to design jewelry, I'm going to start designing jewelry. It, there's no limitation, and I also move from one to the other really rapidly and really simply. If I want to make a cool little ring, boom. Let's print this. Matt and I are going to print this when we go home. Just kidding. But the point being in this is that there is, there's no limit. I built this room last night. This is four walls and a roof, or a roof. We got some columns here. I can quickly duplicate things. Look, now I have a second floor, even though people are probably going to fall in. But the whole point is just that things can be really loose and quick, or let me bring this chair into the light through my layers. Same chair that's sitting up there. This is the original 3D model. So you guys will be able to better see what we're working with. Completely 3D, these, these files exist for, for forever. So if this chair burns up in a fire, or if, I don't know, one of you guys steal it, we'll just print another one. So go ahead. Here are all the parts, and it's pretty straightforward. These layers are even visualized inside the, pr the program, so this is just a flattened stroke that we duplicated, but yeah, I, I wanted to just point, point out that this exists digitally in this form, and that it, it also was, it wasn't taken seriously. You know, th this, this, this program, no one thought that you could create something like this inside of it and, and have an output to be creating real physical things. So that's ultimately what's most inspiring. What also is great about this program is that I'm in a room and those of you that are in interior design, why I wanted to show this demo is because I have a little coffee table here. What I'll do is flatten it, push it up against the wall, maybe bring it out a little And then all of a sudden I have shelves. And then what if we want to visualize maybe what a couch looks like over here? So much easier than, than using actual CAD software 
Let's make a cool little couch really quick. This could work. Something like that. Get our edges nice and sharp. And then I'll turn my sub D on. Boom, couch. How long did that take? 10 seconds, 15 seconds. Um, what else do we want a chair? Do we want to make a chair from scratch? So yeah, just by really quickly adding points and sort of figuring things out, we can start to create a whole number of different things. Again, I'm gonna just make sure that it is nice and kind of sharp. Turn the smoothing on. Cute little chair. And it's in conversation with the sofa too. Isn't that convenient? So yeah, I'm not gonna give, I'm not gonna like show every secret that I have, but look how filled out this room is. And I've been in here for maybe five minutes. And I have my nice little scale model here, who by the way is like average height or a little below, I guess, 1.65 meters. So everything's to scale. These layers in here, if you come up afterwards and try to measure one of these, I bet you it's close to 30 millimeters. And the seat length, I bet you it's close to, to uh, I guess, 50 centimeters. This is one to one. We brought everything directly out of this program. So what's really effective is that the architecture was built in Gravity Sketch. The slides were created in Gravity Sketch in VR. The, even the logo that I might run with a little bit because I like this, VR. Everything about the presentation was made in VR other than the images and this, this whole scene was created. Hang on, we lost, we lost the visual again. Oh no. <laughs> you got it. There you go. Cool. So yeah, that's, that's basically the demo. Was I, I just wanted to come into a room and create objects really quickly and show you how you can move things around or duplicate things. Change colors of things. Maybe we like this orange instead. So as an interior designer, I would find this to be very helpful. And, and I, I encourage anyone who's in interior design to start using VR because you can put yourself at this person's face. Let me make myself this guy. We're looking around this room in this, this space at one-to-one -one scale. So I think that's really powerful and I, I wanted to give a demonstration of that. Um, land, earth, all of this stuff here is, is just comprised of very simple geometries that are reflecting this beautiful, where is it? Oh yeah, the sun over here. But yeah, you can, you can sort of imagine this being on some, some water, and just walking in here. And I mean, imagine, imagine showing this to a prof one of your professors. I mean, uh, it's a great example of, of quickly building interior spaces. Um, so I, I mean, I could go on, I, people ask me if I Twitch stream or if I, if I YouTube live or TikTok live my sessions, and I, I think I will soon, but uh, I could go on forever with this process uh, and I could show you guys a whole number of things. Um, but the creation is very, it's very fluid. It, it's, it's drawing and it's, it's very gestural but at the same time, you can move through space quickly and really start to define impactful geometries that exist in reality. So this is where the demo ends by looking at this chair that's also right there. And you saw me do some goofy stuff in between just to visualize, but all of the power is there and it's all been laid out for you. So we're gonna do a Q and a, if we have time. So I'm gonna take this off and let's do it. The demo that you just showed, it was done in Gravity Sketch. Um, as far as like when you started with VR and like your whole creative process, was that the app that you started within or you know like 
how did you get you know to this point of just experimentation or you know what kind of guided that to where you were like I want to experiment with in VR? Um, yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Gravity Sketch was the first program, yeah, and it's gone through a lot of iteration. I think it's the most approachable it's ever been now. So it's also free. It's a free program. So Rob's got the headset. Gravity Sketch is free. Y'all are cooking like with gas, with kerosene, you know. So I mean, get making and don't like I said, don't think too much about it. I mean, think about what your intention is. But I figured a lot of this stuff out just as I went. Um, and Gravity Sketch is the tool that I choose to use. Um, but there are lots of really useful VR tools like um, Google makes Tilt Brush, I think, and there's Adobe Medium that Matt and I have experimented with. So you're not limited to just Gravity Sketch, but I just showed what I'm comfortable with. Um, but yeah, the, the possibilities are endless. I just, the more important thing is, is virtual reality and, and using, yeah, it might be annoying, but uh, the Apple Vision Pro is coming out. You know so many different companies are going to be chasing after that to make VR more comfortable, better looking, more attainable. So the tools that you use are important, uh, and VR is the, the more important overarching tool. The program you use inside of that is up to you. Uh, same thing with 3D printing, additive manufacturing. These are things that you can't really ignore. They're just, they're a part of the process, and you can discern where you want to go after that. But follow up, go ahead. Uh, very quick follow up. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, really quick follow up. You mentioned like the Vision Pro, and like one of the interesting things like about that is like it's you know kind of not directly marketed as like a virtual reality headset. Like their word for it is like spatial like computing. So like, what are your thoughts as far as you know just? Speaking on like the future of like virtual reality or spatial computing like within design, or where do you personally see that going? Yeah, I mean, this is why I'm saying sort of what I'm saying and, and why I came here today was to encourage you guys to lean into the, the most contemporary tools that you have access to because in college I was told this is an industry standard. Now I'm giving like a, a talk at a university you know, which no one, no one else in my graduating class can say they've done. And that's because I'm using modern tools. It's not because I'm special. So spatial computing and spatial intelligence that all of us have that we either tap into or we don't tap into, Apple is really just exploiting that. They're saying everyone has spatial intelligence, which is true. It's just objectively true. And you're either utilizing it or you're not. So I think Spatial, spatial intelligence, spatial technology, whatever you want to call it, this market is an inevitability in the same way that those homes are going to continue to be 3D printed. We're not going to like resort back to stick builds uh, after too long because it's, it's not efficient and it's, it's also not cost effective. So as a cost effective means of interpreting your ideas, think of like your brain as the, the, the thing spending money, spending energy. Uh, Spatial intelligence is what allows you to think as fluidly as you ever would have. That's why I'm saying I, I, do, I wasn't a designer of these things until I was put into a spatial uh, technological realm where I was able to sort of use my spatial intelligence. I think Apple is just the most wealthy company to be doing it, but you'll see so many other companies start to build off of that. Microsoft will have a headset out. Um, any company that makes anything will we'll start to tap into this market. And I think it's just because it's an inevitability, really. Go ahead. Yeah, looking to looking back to the documentation phase, I've noticed and I found that it can be a sort of difficult hill to kind of get past because it's the point in which your creations and your art become perceived and touched and inhabited and, and um, kind of taken away from you and it's that sense of release that is um, a very new experience so what have you said and what can you say to those voices that kind of discourage or prevent that release of your work into the world and into other people? Yeah, I mean, I would say it didn't happen unless you document it. So that's why to me it's the most important process, not only because, you know, you could get a little pile of dirt in your hand and go put it on an all-white podium in a museum 
and take really sick photos of it, you're going to have people lining up at the door to see what that is, you know, which is just an analogy for it. it doesn't matter what the intention or execution really even was. What matters is the documentation. So it's not that they're irrelevant, but like <laughs> they kind of are. Like if the documentation is really damn good, it kind of doesn't even re really matter what you did. So I would say the documentation is the, is the most important thing. Whether you share it to the world and have your design stolen like me or whether you keep them in a journal and your documentation is just thoughts written as words on a page, it doesn't have to be photos. It doesn't have to be anything other than what you want it to be. So documentation is just record keeping. You know, it's creating history for yourself so that when you're on your deathbed, you know, God willing, we don't all have Alzheimer's. It's like we can see and, and believe what we've been through because we documented it and everyone will see long after we're gone what we've done. Uh, and that's the other thing which I'll touch on is documentation can illustrate your intention and execution without you having to say a single word. So that's why documentation is super important. Super important. And I would say ignore the, the voices in your head that say, you know, don't. I would say document at all costs and think whether or not you want to share with the world after, or whether or not you want to keep for yourself on a private hard drive or archive somewhere, that's totally fine. Um, but documenting is, is like the most important part of the process. You had a question as well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to using, I guess for this case, gravity space, or just like VR, VR software, in your experience, how much compatibility have you had of taking that and bringing it into other 3D softwares? Yeah, so uh, Gravity Sketch plays well with other kids uh, at, at recess. Uh, so you can create, export, and, and start to work on it in other programs pretty easily, whether that's Blender, free program, Rhino, more expensive program, uh, Maya, Cinema, whatever shot, you know, you can export and render directly in Keyshot. So, um, Think about all those nuances later and, and just get into VR and start creating cool shit that you wouldn't have otherwise made. Um, and then, you know, the other programs can wait, <laughs> you know, but it, it does, to, to answer your question, yeah, it does work well with other programs. Uh, I have three stickers for you guys. I have two more. If anyone wants to formulate a question. John, up top, what's good? Um, I didn't hear you mention uh, Yeah, no, absolutely. So I was, um, I forgot to shout out Ethan Hickerson, a really talented photographer who shot that top down view of the, the white slides. But he and I have been talking the last couple of weeks uh, on collaborating in a whole number of ways beyond just clothes, even. So, um, yeah, I mean, I would love to get into more uh, elaborate pieces of things that you can put on your body. The bags are a good example of that. Um, and when it comes to clothing, you know, I, I like to wear comfortable things. I like to wear simple and comfortable things. So that just happens to be the approach to the clothes a lot of the time. And graphics are just really fun to make. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would love to get into more complex garments and, and stuff like that with, you know, there's so many talented people in Richmond that are doing that. Um, it's really just about finding the time. Um, and like I said, you know, Everything's one of one, so this crew neck's different than the one that John is wearing up there, and it's it's different than the other ones that we've made because we intentionally just printed them kind of in different spots on the the garment, and that's not to be lazy; it's to be intentionally executing uh, a thought of just being unique, and that it's we're not a brand; we're not going to just stamp things out all the same or send off, you know, our designs to be drop shipped you know, or something. We made these by hand. The one he's wearing up there, we, me and Malcolm screen printed by hand. And that's really important is to just stay true to that. And yeah, hopefully through all the collaborations, whoever's down to keep things small scale, small batch and one of one, then, you know, the sky's the limit. But I have one more sticker. He's going to get two. 
But um, just like one kind of big question is just like, just within success in general, um, especially like reaching like a point that, you know, you have, you know, with just with your designs and, you know, art, there's a moment that you spoke about, just it's different for everyone, but there's this major kind of period of like a lot of adversity before you can start to, you know, see things come to fruition and pay off. So mm -hmm. for you and like your business partner, like that stage where you guys were, you know, in your senior year and like a lot of your, you know, professors are like threatening to fail you and all of those things, like during, during that time, like, how did you kind of just overcome, you know, that adversity and kind of just remain true to like what you had going or what you guys had going? Yeah, I mean, it's really just, it's not something that anyone uh, can give to you. I, I, I'm here today to hopefully inspire the people that are here that if you like it, it's good. So if, if you're going through this three-step process of intention, execution, documentation, and you get to the end and you don't like it, then maybe it's not good. But if, if you got to the end and you, you can genuinely step back from it, and it gives you a feeling of peace and of, of calm and of success in your own heart, then, you know, it honestly doesn't matter what anyone else is saying. So what's really cool about the academic story was that we rewrote our curriculum for our senior year. So we went against people saying, you know, we couldn't do something, and it is, it's leading to success. So be stubborn, I would say. I would say find out what it is you like, and then don't back off of that, you know, that you liking it is the whole, it's everything. You liking it is like, you know, I remember being told in school that like me just, me saying that something is good because I like it was not a good enough reason. You know, it was not an adequate enough academic answer. I wasn't analyzing the, the details of the design, but especially if you're making it, you're bringing it out of your brain and putting it into reality. If you like it and you feel good about it, keep doing that. And, and have faith in that process, have faith in yourself because no one else is going to, I guarantee you. Uh, no one else is going to have faith in you like you are. <laughs> so that's, that's the major takeaway, I guess, hopefully, is that you, know, you, you have to have faith in your creative process. And those three words that I mentioned over and over again, those help me uh, really just preserve the faith that I have in my own creative process. So, yeah. One question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everything really cool, really <laughs> fun. Uh, several times you mentioned that everything is one of a kind, one, one off, and so on. You also mentioned business, mm -hmm. and yep. you mentioned not brand. Yep. So. I don't see how all this goes together in the sense that one of kind is great and so on, but it's not a feasible business model mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, to be a business, you have to eventually go into a mass production. Yeah. So studio exists to basically prove you wrong, essentially, or to prove that idea wrong in the same sense that VR and 3D printing were an industry standard. You know, we have these capitalist-driven business uh, standards, you know, industry standards, call them, of how a successful business runs. Um, and I think I just have a different concept of what it can be. I'm 26 standing before you today, very young. I have a lot to learn and figure out. I don't, by any means, have anything figured out. Um, but the sale and, and the, the profitability of the essence of what studio is, is like through the roof. So it's why it's kind of like we're artists, you know, that are making our art more accessible. You know, we're not painting canvases that are five grand a piece because if we were doing that and people were buying them, business is booming, no one would have any question about it. So it's really about making sculptures, making the canvas something as affordable as like that yellow vase, which I think on our website is like a hundred, hundred bucks. Yeah, so it's like, it's creating that process. It's, it's, it's finding a formula to create over and over again in a, in a way that an artist would. Um, and 
really just having that energy and that activation energy to keep creating and keep selling objects. You know, if you take examples like Wendell Castle mm -hmm. or Tom Hucker <laughs> or any of these people, which are masters and so on, mm -hmm. but they their business was feasible only because there was Peter Joseph way <laughs> behind that basically was economically making it feasible. Right. Of course, technology is completely different yep. from what you're doing from what they were doing. Absolutely. But still, you know, in today's system, <laughs> which we may like it or we may not like it, <laughs> but we do live it, you know, um, the economical profit, uh, profit yeah. is kind of a guiding factor. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the goal for us is to be in our own space creating art. So that's, that's pretty much the end and the beginning. You know, it's like we want to be making these chairs uniquely, but at a certain capacity, you know, to where obviously the rent is being paid on the space and the technology that we're using that I'm not going to get into the weeds of. But that's sort of what the goal is from a upscaling perspective, someone who wants to know where the business is going. We're going into a bigger space. We're not printing things at our house. And much like Zellerfeld, they're sending one of one shoes all over the world. So they've developed a process through technology to have a one of one input and a one of one output. And they're worth like $20 million, I think, at this point. So it's really just about Matt and I getting to a point where we're a mini art factory. And that's the goal, is to not be a brand like Zellerfeld is, but to be artists with the output of a business. And so that's why uh, it's a unique perspective on modern making, because there's very few people that are uh, doing that presently. That's why it's a scary you know, thing. It's a pioneering position to be in. But we, we love that. I love that you know, we're leaning into it. But that's a, a great question, and I appreciate it. Um, Cliff, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it.